Okay guys, this is your homework help video for your uh, Unit 5 Review Study Guide. Um, the first uh, few questions are all about um, transformations. So before I begin going over the problems, I'll review some key stuff here with you. <clears throat> Alright, so suppose I have some function f of x. Okay. If I have, if I take my function and I add a certain amount to it, that's a vertical translation up. That just means it slides the graph up. And if I were to subtract a number from my function, that would be a translation down. In other words, it moves your graph downwards moves every point down however many spaces that matches the a value. Um, now when you put that value inside the parentheses you still have a translation but now it's moving it left and right. So this would be a horizontal translation and when it's minus it's going to be going to the right which is kind of odd. I would think minus goes left but there's a reason for that but it actually goes to the right. And then the opposite, of course, f of x plus a is a horizontal translation to the left. Okay. Um, we also have reflections. So if you multiply your function by a negative on the outside, that is a vertical reflection across the x-axis. It flips it upside down over the x-axis. Whereas if you put a negative inside, that's a horizontal reflection across the y-axis. So it flips it across the y-axis. Next, um, if you multiply your function by some value, that's going to stretch it vertically. Uh, well, actually, the worksheet's going to use the word expand, so I'll use that. So that's a vertical expansion by a factor of A. And that just means it stretches your graph vertically. If you multiply your function by um, a reciprocal, or a fraction if you will, that's a vertical compression by a factor of A. If you multiply the inside by A, um, that's going to be a horizontal compression by a factor of A. I'm just going to put quotation marks. And then if you divide the X by A, or in other words, 1 over A times X, then that's a horizontal stretch or expansion, we should say by a factor of A. Okay? So, those are all of our transformations that we learned earlier this year. We're going to delve into a little bit. So, let's go ahead and take a look. So, um, describe the transformation necessary to transform the graph of F onto G. So, in other words, here's my starting function, and this is where we end up. And as you can see, to get from here to here, we have to do two things. We have to put on there a negative in front, and we also have to put a plus 3 inside the brackets there with the x. Now, what we just saw on the last slide is that whenever you put a negative in front of your square root or in front of your function, that would be a vertical reflection across the x-axis. And when you add a number inside the parentheses, or in this case, the square root bracket, that's going to be a horizontal translation 
to the left three spaces. And I can specify three spaces here because it tells us it's three. So now you guys don't need to graph anything here, but just to kind of give you an idea what we're doing, the square root of x usually looks like this. But we're doing two things to this function now to turn it into this function. We're flipping it upside down and moving it three spaces to the left. So if I flip this upside down, it's going to curve this way. And then if I move it to the left three spaces, it's going to look like that. So that's been flipped upside down and moved three spaces to the left. You don't need to draw the picture, but just kind of demonstrating. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So what kind of transformations do we have here? Um, so in this case, we're multiplying our x by a number greater than 1, right? And so when that happens, you have a horizontal compression by a factor of 2. And we're also subtracting inside the parentheses 2. That's a horizontal translation to the right. I'll use an arrow instead of writing the word right. Two spaces. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next one there. So in this case, to get from here to here, we're adding a 3 on the inside. That's a horizontal translation to the left. Three spaces. And we're subtracting a number outside of the parentheses, in this case, absolute value bars. And that's a vertical translation down two spaces. Okay. So I'm just going to do a, a lot of examples just so you guys can get a chance to see a few different ones. So in this case here, that's a vertical reflection across the x-axis. And here, that's inside the parentheses, so that's going to be a horizontal translation to the right one space. Okay, let's go ahead and look at another one. So in this case, we have two differences. We have a negative. And that negative is going to cause us to, and it's outside the brackets here, right? So that's going to be a vertical reflection across the x-axis. But that 2, um, since that's a number that's bigger than 1, that's going to be a vertical expansion by a factor of 2. Um, I think we've already done one like that, so I'm going to go ahead and skip that one. Um, I'll show you the answer if you want to see it, but um, getting kind of repetitive at this point. All right. So on this one, it's kind of just the flip, reverse type of question that we just asked. On the last one, they gave you both equations and asked you to describe it. On this one, they give you the original function, then they tell you what to do to it to create a new function, which we'll call g of x. Okay? All right, so we're translating it to the right two units. Now, when you translate something to the right two units, that means you're going to do, you're going to, in the parentheses, you're going to do x minus 2. Okay? We're also going to translate it up three units. And so when you translate something up two units, that's outside the parentheses, you're going to add three. Now, since we're dealing with an absolute value here, inside the parentheses means inside the absolute value bars, and outside the parentheses means outside the absolute value bars. And so there's your answer there. So that's a translation to the right and a shift up of three. Another one. So this one they want us to compress it vertically by a factor of 3. On the last slide I put G. I should have wrote F here because we're transforming the F function. 
So if you want to compress it vertically by a factor of 3, we're going to multiply it by the reciprocal of 3. That's a number less than 1 now, right? It compresses it vertically. We're also going to translate it down 1 unit, so it means we're going to subtract 1. Okay? So in this case, my f of x is just this absolute value function, right? So we're going to be multiplying the absolute value function by 1 third and subtracting 1 from that. And there's your final outcome. All right, how about this one? We're reflecting it across the x-axis. So that means we're going to take our function and we're going to put a negative in front of it. And then we're also going to translate it down two units. So there's that and then there's that. In this case, my function is x cubed, right? So it's going to be negative x cubed minus 2. That's the new equation. All right, next one. Translate this thing left one unit. So when you're translating something to the left, you take the x and you're going to add that amount to it. So that's going to be a translation one space to the left. And this is a translation down three units. Okay, so now for the inside ones, my function is x cubed, right? But instead of x cubed, now it's going to be x plus 1 cubed. And the minus 3 is on the outside. So remember, inside changes go inside the function, right? All right, um, let's go ahead and move on to another. It might be it. We might have two more of these. So we want to reflect this across the x-axis. So here's my function, right? So I want to reflect it across the x-axis. That means we put a negative in the front. And we also want to translate it to the right two units. When you translate something to the right, in the parentheses, you subtract that amount. So there's our final answer. Negative absolute value of x minus 2. All right, so this thing's being compressed horizontally by a factor of 2. So when you have that, you're going to multiply the inside x by 2. And then we're going to translate it down one unit, so that means we subtract 1 on the outside. So final answer could look like this. I doubt they're going to simplify it, but you could technically rewrite this as 8x cubed minus 1. But they'll probably just leave it like that. Let's see what the software does. Yeah, they just leave it in the parentheses. Okay. So that's that. Uh, another thing you guys will be asked to do is you're going to be asked to graph piecewise functions here. Um, all right, Give me up eight. I'm gonna cover up all this stuff. I'm not going to use the multiple choice myself. I'm just going to put the answer. All right, so we learned how to do this in class a little while ago, back in unit two, I think it was. All right, um, so a piecewise function is a function where it's basically two functions that are being pieced together. Um, for anything where x is less than or equal to negative 3, it's going to be this square root function. And for anything where x is greater than negative 3, it's just going to equal negative 5. So what we do is, is we start with this point of negative 3. And then I'm going to pick two other points that are less than negative 3. So that would be like negative 4 and negative 5. Um, and then I plug them in. Now I am, I think I'm going to change the numbers I pick though, because with square roots you kind of want to be a little bit trickier with what numbers you plug in. Uh, but we just need some numbers that are less than negative 3. So let's, let's do the negative 3 first. If I plug in negative 3 I get 9, the square root of 9 is 3. Okay, what else can we plug in here? I'd like to get a perfect square root if possible. Hmm. That'd be kind of tough to get a perfect square root with that 3 in there. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 36. 
So if I plug in, gosh, I don't know if I want to plug in, I'll plug in negative 12. So if I plug in negative 12, that's also less than negative 3. I get positive 36, and when you take the square root of that, you get 6. Um, I guess we'll just do some other random number. I don't want to go too far out there, so let's plug in like negative 4. Uh, if I plug in negative 4, I'm going to get the square root of 12, which is kind of a nasty number. Let's see what that comes out to be. I was trying to avoid nasty numbers, but we're going to get one anyway. So we'll just say about 3.5. So I've got these three points that are going to be on this curve. You always start with your boundary point, and then you pick two other points that are less than or equal to negative 3. Um, plug them into this equation over here to find the y values. Um, this is 3.5. Then you're going to do the same thing on the bottom here. We start with negative 3, but this time we're going to pick numbers that are greater than negative 3, so like negative 2 and negative 1. Now in this case, when I try to find my y values, I can't plug the 3 in because there's no y value to plug it in or x value to plug it into. And that's just because y is always negative 5 for this one. So we'll just put negative 5 there. Then we have to decide what kind of dots we're going to use. If there's a line underneath, then this boundary point of negative 3 is a solid dot. If there's no line underneath of the inequality, that means that that point doesn't actually exist on this graph, even though that's where we're going to start from. So we're going to use an open dot to represent that that starting point actually doesn't exist. So there you have it. Pick your x values, find your y values, determine what kind of dots they're going to be, and then you're ready to go ahead and graph it. And so I'm going to start with this one, negative 3, 3. And it's a solid dot. Negative 4 and 3.5, not much higher. Um, and then negative 12, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 goes up to 6. So it looks like this. Now I'm going to stop here because this was my starting point. But we're not going to stop here necessarily because it's just oh, it's less than negative 3. So that one keeps going. So you're going to put the curve that looks something like that. It does stop here though because that's a boundary point. So you always start your graph with your pencil on your boundary point and then you go from there. All right, let's do the next one here. Negative 3, negative 5. So at negative 3, we have an open dot at negative 5. Negative 2, negative 5. And negative 1, negative 5. So this is going to be a straight line. So we start at our boundary point, and we go through the other dots, and there it is. So that's what our graph should look like. Okay? So that's graphing piecewise functions. Um, and so I can't really see all of our options here, but uh, my guess is that we, you can kind of tell which answers are good answers, which ones are not. But let me zoom out a little bit so you can find them all. All right. Now notice that we know that B is not it. That doesn't look anything like what we graphed at all, right? Um, this one doesn't look like what we graphed either. It's one of these two. Now notice the only difference is where they put the closed dot. Remember how we said the closed dot was up here? So this answer would have to be C. All right. Um, so piece. Okay, so this one has three pieces to it. <clears throat> so let's begin. Um, we start by picking three points for each of the pieces, right? I start with my boundary point of negative 3, and then I pick some numbers less than negative 3. We're going to plug those in. So if I plug in negative 3, I get negative 4. If I plug in negative 4, I get negative 5. And if I plug in negative 5, get negative 6, and since my inequality has an equal sign underneath, that's a solid dot for the boundary point. Let's jump down to the bottom one here. I'll get back to the middle one in a second. Um, we're going to start at a boundary point of 2, and it's going to be a solid dot once again because there is an equal sign. And then we're going to pick numbers greater than 2, like 3 and 4. 
So let's plug those in. 2 minus 2 is 0, 3 minus 2 is 1, and 4 minus 2 is 2. Now for the middle one here, we have two boundary points. And so we're going to have the left boundary point is negative 3, and the right boundary point is 2. And the third point could be anything in between there, so we'll say 0. Now in this case, there's nowhere to plug these in, do. So they're all the y value of negative 6 there. Notice that neither one of these boundary points have an equal sign. So both of those boundary points will be open dots. And then we're ready to begin our graphing. So let's begin. I'll start with the top one here. We have negative 3 and negative 4. Then we have negative, and that's a solid dot. Then we have negative 4 and negative 5 and negative 5 and negative 6. So we have a straight line here and it's, we're going to start at our boundary point and go through with an arrow there. So that takes care of the first one. Do the next one here. We're going to plot negative 3, positive 6. And that's an open dot. 0, 6, closed dot. 2, 6, open dot. I notice I use a closed dot here because um, you only need to decide if the in, the boundary points are open or closed. These are all boundary points. The other ones are just random points that we're picking, and those are always going to be closed. Um, so we have a nice straight line there. And then finally, we have the last one, 2, 0, closed dot, 3, 1, and then 4, 2, arrow. And there we go. So which of these options look most correct here? Hmm, probably. Looks like option C is the way to go. So, All right. Here's another thing they're going to ask you to do. They're going to ask you to find, evaluate a function for a piecewise. So they want to know what is f of negative 3, and we're going to use the problem from number 14 back here. So we want to know what is f of negative 3. This was it's a really easy question, but um, it kind of comes and goes so quickly. I think people kind of missed it, and so they missed that a lot last time. It's pretty easy, though. You don't miss this question. So this is negative 3. Now, where is negative 3 at on these intervals? On which interval is negative 3? It's here. I know there's a negative 3 here, too, but it can't. X can't equal negative 3 here, right? But here it can equal negative 3. So since this X value is on this interval, we're going to plug that X value into this function. So it's going to be negative 3 minus 1, which is negative 4 is the answer. Okay. I think I have another question after that, which this one asks us for number 16 to find F of positive 3. So if I come back to this function again, on what interval is positive 3? It's on this interval. This is the interval where x can be greater than or equal to 2. And the number 3 is greater than or equal to 2. So we're on this interval, which means I'm going to use this function to plug it in. So it's going to be 3 minus 2, which is 1. Okay. So you just have to know what piece to plug it into, and you can tell what piece it is by looking at the intervals. All right, let's go to that half. I think, I think there was another half. Let's look at that. So we're also going to review solving square root functions. The way you solve a square root function is by squaring both sides, because squares cancel out roots. After you do that, it's just got some basic algebra to do. Got to be careful though. Sometimes you can end up with an answer after doing everything right, and that answer is actually a false answer called an extraneous solution. It's nine, it's like to me. All right, so there it is. Now, how can you tell if it's an extraneous solution? Extraneous solutions are solutions where even though you got an answer and you did everything right, it may not be a legal answer to have. 
your answer cannot make this num the piece under the square root become negative. So let's plug it in and see if it does that. I'm going to plug it in on both sides. Over here we have 18 minus 13, which is 5. And over here we have 27 minus 22, which is 5. Now neither one of those came out negative square roots, so we're good. So this is my answer. Now if we did end up with a negative underneath, what we would do is we'd stop and say no solution. Okay, so here's the next one here. Um, in this example, we have a square root, right? But we also have numbers that are not in the square root. When you have that situation, what you want to do is get rid of the numbers that are not in the square root first. So I'm going to minus that 4 on both sides. Sometimes you'll have a, a number in front of the square root as well. If that's the case, you divide it out. But here we're going to be done. And then the next thing we do is we want to get rid of the square root, so we square both sides, right? So those go away. Add one, and so on. Not too bad. So we get x equals 1. Once again, you want to make sure it doesn't make the inside of your square root negative. So if you were to plug this in, You don't really need the rest of this. You really just need the square root part, but might as well check our answer as we go. You get 17 times 1 is 17. Take away 1 is 16. Square root of 16 is 4. And so we did not end up with a negative in the square root, so we're good. So this is a good answer. X equals 1. Okay. Let's take a look at this one. Now in this case, um, we're going to start by squaring both sides to get rid of the root, but that creates a situation that we need to deal with. We have an n and an n squared. Now, when that happens, basically you have a quadratic equation. So the way that you solve quadratic equations is you're going to get everything on one side of the equal sign. So I'm going to start by adding the n over here and by subtracting the 30. And now this side equals 0. And this side is n squared plus n minus 30. Um, there's two different ways you guys can end up solving these. One way you can factor them. Uh, the other way you can use quadratic formula. It doesn't really matter. Um, I know this one factors pretty well. So I think we can just go ahead and do this. And then you can use your zero product property. So you can say n minus 5 equals 0, and n plus 6 equals 0. So solving this one, we can find out n equals 5. And solving this one, we find out n equals negative 6. But once again, we have to check these to make sure that they do not make the, the uh, inside of our square root negative. So 30 minus n. So if I were to plug in a 5, would that make the inside negative? No. So that's a good answer. And if I were to plug in a negative 6, that would also be fine. So we're good. Those are both good answers. <laughs> um, what's next? We're looking at roots, simplifying roots. So in this case, we're not solving for r. What we're doing is we're just because there's no equal sign, right? We're just going to break down the square root and simplify it as much as possible. So 45 is 9 times 5, and 9 is 3 times 3. So we have 3 times 3 times 5, and there's two r's there. And we're doing a normal square root, so we're taking out pairs. And so we have 3r square root 5. Number 21, same thing. We're going to break it apart here. 256, um, you can break it down however you're comfortable with. I'm pretty sure that's 16 times 16. Mm 
And so we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight twos and three X's. And we're taking out groups of six. So in this case, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six twos right there. For that many, we can take out a two, drop the rest off. Now we have 2 times 2, which is 4, and x times x times x, which is x cubed. And that's that. All right. Um, so you guys might remember that when you have a square root and you have a negative inside, like this, when you, you can get rid of the negative and put an i on the outside, right? But whenever you have a negative on the inside with a q root, you don't take an, you don't put an i on the outside. You just put the negative on the outside. So because cube roots have negative answers, square roots don't have real answers if they're negative on the inside. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite it like this. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So we want to. Break down that 384. Hmm. I feel, I wonder, 384. I feel like that's 18 times 18. Let's, let me see. Ah, oh, 324, darn it. Okay, guess we'll just break it down the long way. Um, 2, 1, 9, 2. Um, 96, I believe, is 12 and 8. Oh, this is 4 and 3, sorry. So we have all these ends of our branches here. <clears throat> big number. Hello. So let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven twos. That's a lot of twos. And then we have a three. And then six X's. And we're taking out groups of three. So there's one, so I can take out a two. There's another one, so I can take out another two. Got some X's. Some more X's. So that's all outside of the square root. I don't want to forget my negative also, by the way. <laughs> and then on the inside, we have six. So we have negative. 4x squared on the outside. We'll multiply all those together. And then on the inside with the cube root of 6. Okay. All right. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to graph this function. So the first thing we want to do for number 23 is get the y by itself. So I'm going to add to x and 10 on both sides. Then I'm going to divide everything by negative 2. And that way we get the y by itself. And then we're ready to graph. The number right here is my y-intercept. My slope is negative 1, which means I'm going to go down 1, over 1. So from here, we're going to go down 1 and over 1. Connect your dots. 24 is a little repetitive, so I think I'll go ahead and skip that. Let you guys do that as a practice if you want. Um, let's go ahead and move on to last type of question. Finding the equation of a line. So, um, first thing we want to do is find our slope. After that, we're going to find our b. 
and then we can write our equation. All right, so I'm going to call this one x1, y1, and this one x2, y2. So we have y2. I'll write the formula out in case you guys want to see it. So it's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. 1 take away 3 is negative 2, and 0 take away 3 is negative 3, and the double negatives cancel. Our final simplified slope there is 2 thirds. Now we've got to find the b. To find the b, we're going to plug in something for the first three letters and solve for b after that. So I'm going to use this point. So I'm going to use 3 for x and 3 for y. And I know my m now is 2 thirds. Okay, so this is going to be 3 equals, think of that as 3 over 1, 6 over 3 plus b. That simplifies to 2. And then we subtract the 2 on both sides. And we end up with b equals 1. So after you have that, you can write your final equation. 2 thirds x plus 1. All right. And that's that, guys. And there's another one down there for you guys to practice if you like. I'm pretty sure that ends the study guide there. All right. See you tomorrow.